Good evening. Once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. Going to do another video this evening talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. And uh, I, I don't believe how fast things are moving right now. It seems like every single day there are news stories that are just mind-boggling. And it seems like almost every week the videos are just getting more and more important. We are so close to the end. It's it's incredible. And, and I can say that in all confidence. No man knows the day or the hour, but we are sure close. And uh, these news stories today are just further proof. And I, I, I feel <laughs> burdened in my heart because people will not wake up. Even the church will not wake up. And, and the Bible, Bible makes it clear that most people are going to be lost. Most people are going to worship the beast. They're going to accept the mark, and they're going to go to hell. And that's, the, that's what the Bible actually says. Now, the Bible also says, though, that the Lord is very patient and long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The problem is, you, people, people have free will, and they will not come to God. They just will not see what's going on. and They're blinded, and they're deceived, and they're following the world, and they're following after Satan. They seem to think that man's going to have all the answers. But if you're watching this video, and you are not saved, please watch all this video. And watch the videos every day. Subscribe to my channel. Keep watching these videos. I pray that you will wake up soon, and if you are not saved, come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ while you still can. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is your only hope. He is the only source of salvation. And He gave us His Word, He gave us His Bi the Bible, and He gave us prophecies in that Bible that are coming to pass so fast right now, and absolutely, literally to the letter. So, hopefully, if you are unsaved, you have been brought to this video and to this channel for a reason. And I just pray that, that God will speak to your heart. And you will uh, see what's truly going on as we move closer and closer to the end of this age and the second coming of Jesus Christ and the Battle of Armageddon. So, with that, I have a... Let's get into this. I have a lot of really, really important news stories today uh, and a lot of scripture I want to cover. But... Um, Pope Francis, wow. I, I got to tell you guys, buckle your seatbelts. Pope Francis is, is, is moving things along so fast right now. Um, again, I have yet to come out and call anybody the, for sure the Antichrist or for sure the false prophet because neither have been totally revealed yet. But I, I got to tell you, the more I watch Francis, the more I'm actually thinking he's the Antichrist, not the false prophet. And uh, I have an interesting idea for the false prophet today out of one of my news stories. But, uh, again, I don't know. Obama could play into this. I, I really don't know. But I'm telling you right now, the players are getting in place. And the final seven-year period of time is so close to starting. Uh, but, again, Pope Francis, wow, is he uh, really doing a lot of things right now. And the world is eating it up. The world is absolutely eating it up. The world is going to worship the beast. The world is all too happy to follow the person that they think has all the answers, just like Obama in 2008. And how has that worked out for the planet? Not all that great. Most people who voted for him would tell you that. Um, so let's let's go on. Uh, here's the first news story today. Uh, the Pope just helped the U.S. and Cuba make up. Make up. What can he fix next? Trust me, he's going to have his hands in everything. Uh, the picture shows him in a Superman costume flying through the air, Pope Francis. Um, boy, uh, this seriously is giving me a headache. Um, here we go. Wednesday's historic deal between the United States and Cuba was noteworthy for a lot of reasons. A fascinating one that has emerged has been the role of Pope Francis. It has been reported that the Pope sent personal letters to Barack Obama and President Raul Castro and joining them to, to reconsider the situation. Then he invited the U.S. and Cuban officials to the Vatican in October to talk things out. 
In the days since the announcement, which His Holiness greeted with warm congratulations, the Vatican has enjoyed wide credit as one of the biggest influences in breaking the decade-old standoff. <clears throat> but those surprised at Pope Francis' role in the negotiation shouldn't be. It goes in to talk about past history of the papacy trying to get involved in stuff like this. Uh, it says, what has changed, though, under Francis, or has been restored, is a vision of diplomatic boldness, a willingness to take risks and insert the Vatican into diplomatic disputes. And like I said, he's going to keep inserting himself into all of these disputes. And eventually, the end result will be a one-world government and a one-world religion. So it says, while Wednesday's deal may have been his biggest success to date, he's managed to pack some ambitious Diplomatic moves into his young reign as the Bishop of Rome. Here's a highlight reel. Keep in mind, he's only been in the Pope for about two years. Israel, Palestine, and that's a big one. One of Pope Francis's most dramatic diplomatic moves to date came this June when he invited the heads of the state of Israel and the Palestinian Authority to the Vatican for an unprecedented prayer meeting. Then, Israeli President Shimon Peres and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas prayed together, talked privately, and planted an olive tree in the gardens, with Perez calling him a bridge builder of brotherhood and peace. Brotherhood and peace. Interesting, because the brotherhood will basically make up the one world religion. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all worshiping the same God. No more Jesus is the only way. No more exclusive religions leading to wars. We all just have to realize we worship the same God and come together. And peace, the peace agreement. So, um, <clears throat> oh boy, there was no concrete, concrete result of the talks, though the degree of goodwill shown between the two sides surprised observers in the conflict. Uh, okay, now I'm going to not get into the next one too much. Uh, it's about China and how he's trying to reestablish relations between Vatican and China and We'll skip over that one. The next one, Islamic extremism. Pope Francis has made the fight against Islamic uh, fundamentalism central to his diplomatic efforts. Past popes have too, but where Pope Benedict was blunt, he once made a controversial speech suggesting Islam was evil and violent. What's so controversial about that? That's a fact. It's amazing how the world sees things. Wow. Um... Pope Francis has tried to take a softer touch. He recently visited Turkey, where he held a joint press conference with Turkish President Erdogan and called on all Muslim leaders to condemn ISIS. At the Blue Mosque, Pope Francis bowed his head silently while the Grand Mufti of Istanbul recited a Muslim prayer. A significant point of concern for Pope Francis is the fate of the Middle East's small but ancient Christian community, which ISIS has targeted. He said in Istanbul that he would not abide, he would not abide a Middle East without... Christians. So he's in he's getting involved in the Palestinian Israeli situation. Don't be surprised if he confirms a covenant with many soon. He's using the Islamic extreme jihadist movement, the these the war on terror, so to speak, again, to try to get all the so called moderate Muslim nations to come against ISIS and terror groups. Promoting the one world religion, the one world government. Let's move on. Syria. Pope Francis has also strongly denounced the civil war raging in Syria. Uh, he traveled to neighboring Jordan this past peace, this, this past spring, to push for peace. And in 2013, he called for a global day of fasting and peace ahead of escalating airstrikes in Syria. Uh, but the strikes went on, planned as, and and the conflict continues. Now. Uh, but he's involved in Syria. Keep in mind, Isaiah 17, 1, burden of Damascus. Damascus is going to be destroyed. It's going to be a ruinous heap. It'll no longer be a city. How much farther along do we have to wait for that prophecy to take place? There's another one he's involved in. Korea. Add Pope Francis to the long list of parties trying to secure peace on the Korean Peninsula. Mm. On the day he arrived in South Korea, the North fired missiles into the sea, minutes before he touched down in Seoul. Uh, but he's, he's involved in, in Korea. And now Guantanamo. If the Pope uh, didn't have enough 
um, conflicts to resolve. John Kerry will, rep re will reportedly be in Rome this week to enlist the Vatican's help with another long-standing political issue, closing the Guantanamo Bay prison. Wow. He, so he's getting his hands involved into absolutely everything, and the world is letting him. The world is hanging on his, his every word, it seems. They are, they are so quick to assume Pope Francis has all the answers. Uh, let's move on. Um, speaking of that, here's, a, here's the title of the next article. Pope Francis continues to take the world by storm. Trust me, there is a storm coming, and Pope Francis is definitely going to be involved, but the world's not going to like how it turns out. And quite frankly, neither is Pope Francis. I feel 100% <laughs> accurate that Pope Francis is one of the two beasts of Revelation. And if I'm right, he'll be cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. It sounds harsh, but it's the truth, and I'm going to keep promoting it. I'm going to keep spreading the word and tell you what's going on. I'm not going to tell you what the world wants to hear. I'm going to tell you the truth. Pope Francis continues to take the world by storm. During the second year of his pontificate, Pope Francis is still feeling the love, and not just from Catholics or those from his homeland of Argentina. A Pew Research study shows that 60% uh, of the 43 nations polled have a positive view of the pontiff. Uh, let me scroll down here. He's taken the world by storm. Uh, he recently told Catholic News uh, that 2014 brought worldwide attention to almost everything Pope Francis said and did, which in so many ways, he said, made the U.S. bishops work easier. Uh, and the bishops were not the only ones to recognize the Pope's appeal. Uh, the, po the pontiff, who was on the cover of many magazines in two th 2013, still had the coveted cover spot, uh, not usually reserved for religious leaders on Rolling Stone magazine in February. <clears throat> there was a talk called the Francis Factor at Georgetown University, which, by the way, is a Jesuit university. Uh, uh, panelists used descriptors as a, as a troublemaker and anti-establishment in their discussion about Pope Francis. They also commended his strong leadership and management style and, of course, his popularity. The conversion he seeks in the world, she says, starts now with us. Which is very interesting because he doesn't ever talk about converting people to Jesus Christ. He talks about bringing people back to the mother church. And, in fact, he said it's dangerous to think you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It says that people who are fundamental Christians have a sickness... And uh, let's see, what else was he famous for? Uh, oh, but he said on his top ten list of ways to be happy, don't try to proselytize others. So the conversion he seeks is not to Christianity. It's to indoctrinate you into his one world religion and government. Let's see here. It's a really long article, wow. Uh, it just, just says, he is truly a Pope of, of unity. He is the Pope of unity, bringing Catholics and non-Catholics together. Uh, you know, the Malachi prophecy said that the last Pope, which is Pope Francis on his list, would be the Pope that would reign during uh, the final seven-year period of time and would destroy the church. And he's certainly looking like the guy. Uh, let's go on. This, this is a weird article title, but I'm going to cover it because it's a weird article title because they don't mention either of these actual names in the article. But the entire of the article is Goodbye Bono, Hello Kissinger. It's out of the hill today. But it's just more about the political power of Pope Francis. <sighs> Since Pope Francis stepped on the world stage, he has been given rock star status by Catholics, Christians, and skeptics alike. Even the media love him for paying attention to the Fort estate, Fourth Estate and going off script by giving non-Vatican-approved interviews. He put himself out there in a way that few of his predecessors have, and now he's the broker of a world-changing deal between President Obama and Cuba's Raul Castro. 
For the first time in 50 years, the U.S. is normalizing um, relations with Cuba. Um, it says, why didn't the deal fall apart? Because Pope Francis promised both sides would live up to the commitments. <laughs> wow. Uh, talk about transcending geopolitical differences. The Pope has gone from the new face of, of Catholicism to an astute political player. Like I said, he's not a Christian. I say this every night, it seems like. Pope Francis is not a Christian leader. He's supposedly the leader of the largest Christian denomination in the world, 1.2 billion Catholics. But trust me, he is a political pawn in the New World Order, part of the unholy trinity, Satan, Antichrist, false prophet. Uh... Let's see here. It says, it hasn't always been so that the highest ranking Catholic yielded so much influence. And they talk about Pope Pius getting involved um, with the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. I'm going to skip over that. Up until now, Pope Francis' scope of authority has centered on social issues. Yet, thanks to his well-accepted authority as a moral beacon and as one, and one has to presume his high likability quotient, he was able to help broker a deal simply based on a verbal promise that ultimately he couldn't really enforce. Uh, this is not Pope Francis's first toe dipping into mending worldwide fences. In 2013, he wrote to Russian President Vladimir Putin calling for him to oppose a military intervention in Syria. In May, he hosted Israeli President Shimon Peres and PA Pre Authority President Mahmoud Abbas to pray for peace. This summer, he sent a telegram to China's president when the country allowed the papal plane uh, to cross into Chinese airspace, something others haven't been able to accomplish. Uh, Pope, uh, president Obama and Pope Francis agree on more than just Cuba. Both are staunch advocates of fixing income inequality. The Pope says he wants a church that is poor and f for the poor. If the church is poor, how does it help the poor? Yeah, anyway... Um, his deep belief in Catholic social just, uh, justice teachings, combined with his love for the poor, put him firmly planted in Obama's immigration amnesty camp. Can we expect more from him on these issues? You betcha. The president is, exist his, is exiting stage left in two years. Don't be so sure about that. But uh, his president is exiting stage left in two years. Meanwhile, this pope, who never sets sight on being a leader of 1.2 billion Catholics, will most likely be around for much longer, yielding his ever-growing foreign policy prowess. Trust me, again, he is going to be wielding his foreign policy prowess like you've never seen before. And quite frankly, he's been given his seat and great authority by Satan himself, by the dragon. Um... Wow. By the way, he's talking about a poor church, but I promise you, the Vatican, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church is not poor. I can assure you of that. All right, let's move on. <sighs> Here is an interesting article. I said at the beginning of this video, I have a possible interesting false prophet possibility if Francis is the Antichrist. This article, very interesting. Mega church pastor. Come on along. Mega church pastor Rick Warren joins Pope Francis in support of common mission. Could it be Rick Warren turns out to be the false prophet? He's certainly working hand in hand with Pope Francis right now, and he's virtually worshiping Pope Francis now. Quite frankly, so does Joel Osteen. But, Pope, but Rick Warren is the one who's really out there in front promoting all this. Rick Warren has also been heavily involved in Chrislam. It seems like he may have the possible power, so to speak, to bring the Chrislam thing into, into the forefront and bring on the so-called um, the, the so uh, peaceful, moderate Muslims to worship the Pope and the One World Religion and the Beast. Let's see. This is interesting. Founder of Saddleback Church draws ire of fellow Protestants for Rome-leaning views. Uh, the world will not endure sound doctrine anymore. 
Pastor Rick Warren has called on non-Catholic Christians to join with Pope Francis and the Catholic Church in pursuit of their common goals. Oh, boy. Uh, Warren is founder and pastor of California's well-known Saddleback Church and author of best-selling books, including The Purpose Driven Church, which has sold 36 million copies, excuse me, The Purpose Driven Life, and The Purpose Driven Church. Pastor Warren has was among the speakers in November 2014 at Humanum, the Vatican's International Religious Colloquium on the Complementa- <laughs> Complementarity of Man and Woman. Humanum brought together faith leaders from both Christian and non-Christian religions around the world to examine and propose anew the beauty of the relationship between man and woman in marriage. How will the Vatican understand about that? They can't get married. Why is the Vatican Church talking about marriage and man and woman? Let's go on. In an interview uh, on the Catholic TV station EWTN, um, Warren called the adherence of various Christian denominations to unite with Roman Catholics and Pope Francis to work together on three shared goals. Let me read that again. Warren called for adherence of various Christian denominations to unite with Roman Catholics and Pope Francis to work together on three shared goals, focusing on the sanctity of life, the sanctity of sex, and the sanctity of marriage. He went on to defend Catholicism, and get this, to clarify some of the most common misconceptions about Catholic teaching pertaining to Marian dogmas and prayer to the saints. So now Rick Warren is defending those dogmas or doctrine, whatever you want to call it, Marian doctrine, dogmas and prayer to the saints. Warren acknowledged that there are still differences which separate Catholics from other Christian denominations. He envisions Catholics and Protestants working together, not with a structural unity, but rather with a unity of mission. If you love Jesus, he said, we're on the same team. Pastor Warren's remarks were polite and well-reasoned and were well-received in the Catholic community. To hear some conservative Christians tell the story, though, you would think that Warren was devoid of reason and without a moral compass. Evangelical Reformed apologist James White, director of Alpha and Omega Ministries, and an avowed anti-Catholic, called on Warren to repent. Praise God, I'm right there with you, Brother White. Matt Slick of the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry was openly critical, mistakenly claiming that Catholics had added seven books to the Bible, Brian Houston of Hillsong Church expressed alarm about Warren's subtle backslide into Catholicism and claimed that his concern is shared by Christians nationwide. Uh, guys, there is a if, if the rapture does not happen, there is a war coming between true Christians, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, and the Laodicean Church. It's coming. You can see it. It's brewing. And uh, the world is, is going to turn, if it hasn't already, it seems like it has, it is going to turn against any Bible-believing, born-again Christian who's willing to stand up for the inerrancy of the Word of God and the fact that Jesus Christ is the only source of salvation. We are going to be, uh, we're just, I mean, depending on what happens, it could get, but it could be, we could die. We could die for our faith. There's no question about that. And, uh, that will be an honor and a glory to God if we do that. It's just, but it's going it, to, who knows, it's going to get crazy. Uh, let's see. Warren is not the first Protestant pastor to respond with warmth to the words of Pope Francis. Uh, and it goes on to talk about Bishop Tony Palmer, and then you've got uh, Kenneth Copeland, Joel Osteen. Uh, they were uh, trying to say that uh, Catholics... Well, it says that he told the Pentecostal gathering, Kenneth Copeland did, he told the Pentecostal gathering that the, vis- that the divisions between Catholics and Protestants have had no reason to exist since the 1999 Catholic-Lutheran Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. And that agreement by Catholics and Lutherans recognized that by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our own part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. Uh, but that's really not what the Catholics believe. They can say they believe that all they want, 
But then they're going to tell you, you have to have part, take part in the Holy Eucharist. You have to, there's so many things you have to do to have salvation. And then you still can't know if, you're going, if you've got salvation. you got to go finish earning your salvation in purgatory. Uh, let's go on. Uh, Kenneth Copeland uh, asked the Pentecostals um, to, uh, to pray to the Lord that he will unite us all. He expressed his longing for the day when this separation would end and there would be communion. He urged the Pentecostals listening to allow our longing to increase so that it, pro it propels us to find each other, embrace each other, and praise Jesus Christ as the only Lord of history. Let us move forward, the Holy Father said. Let us, we are brothers. Let us give each other a spiritual embrace and allow the Lord to complete the work he has begun. Because this is a miracle. The miracle of unity has begun. The one world religion is coming together so fast. Let's move on. I'm still got a lot I want to cover. Um, there's a similar article uh, to one I just read, but it had a couple other interesting points in it. So let me find this one. Po the Pope Francis Stardust worked over Cuba. Could it work with ISIS and the Taliban? <sighs> Francis had a diplomatic triumph this week. If only he could resolve the world's bloodiest conflicts too. Uh, let's see. Let's see. I'm just trying to skip over stuff I've already covered from the other article. It says, It would be nice to think that the Pope, like some white Catholic superhero, could make the difference, bringing his healing power to Pakistan or Iraq, but it's hardly likely the difference between the Cuba example and those others apparently intractable conflicts reveals much about the nature of peacemaking and about the pain without which peace is often impossible. Um... This is now they they also quote Jonathan Powell, who was Tony Blair's right hand. Now remember, Tony Blair has his faith foundation. Tony Blair's also had his hands in the one world religion, and they're talking about how to get peace. And he says Tony Blair's right hand, uh, to Jonathan Powell, who was Tony Blair's right hand, did so much to broker an agreement in Northern Ireland. At least two conditions have to obtain to make a peace realistic prospect. Peace a realistic prospect. There need to be strong leaders on both sides able to deliver on any concession that they might make. Both sides need to find the status quo unbearable and simultaneously believe that there is no way to alter the status quo through, for, through force alone. Only then will they be willing to compromise. Um, Uh, that's enough on that one. Uh, this is getting too long. i got other stuff to cover. But I'm going to put all of this into the description box so you can look at it yourself. But, um, again, the headline of that one was, The Pope Francis Stardust Worked Over Cuba. Could it work with ISIS and the Taliban? I'm going to tell you right now, no man on this earth, period, is going to have the answers to bringing peace. The world is going to think there's a guy that has the answers. And they're going to be willing to follow him. And he's going to bring in a false sense of peace. But war is coming. All right. Whew. Let's talk about what's going on in Israel again. Uh, this article, a couple of these articles are just amazing. Uh, all right. Hamas official says a new chapter opened with Iran. Now remember, we're letting Iran... Continue to work on a nuclear program. They say they want it for peace, peaceful purposes only. Hamas has it in their charter that they want to annihilate Israel. The Ayatollah from Iran is also constantly talking about how they're going to annihilate Israel. And now Hamas official comes out and says there's a new chapter open with Iran. Hamas representative says a recent visit to by Hamas delegation to Iran opened a new chapter in relations between the two. Ali Baraka, Hamas's representative in Lebanon, said Friday that a recent visit by Hamas delegation to Iran 
had opened a new chapter in relations between Tehran and the terror group. Tehran has pledged to continue supporting the Palestinian resistance. Hamas welcomes the support of any Arab or Muslim state, but unfortunately the Arabs are just spectators to the systematic Judaization of Jerusalem by Israel and the expansion of illegal settlements. We have not received responses from a number of Arab countries that we had asked to support us and our people against Israeli aggression. Wow. He charged, adding, This has forced us to seek support from other Muslim nations, such as Iran. Nevertheless, Barak has stressed that Hamas was keen on maintaining good relations with Arab countries, along with Turkey and Iran, in order to safeguard the resistance. Now, interesting, he mentions Turkey and Iran, because Turkey and Iran will be with Russia in the War of Gog and Magog. I talked about that in last night's video, Ezekiel 38, and now he links those two together. Iran was a stronger supporter of Hamas, but the two have been, excuse me, Iran was once a stronger supporter of Hamas, but the two have been at odds over the uprising against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. As a result of Hamas's refusal to support Assad in the uprising, an angry Iran supposedly stopped supplying the terror group with weapons. Nevertheless, the two sides have been getting closer in recent months. The Speaker of the Iranian Parliament recently boasted that Iran provided Hamas with the technology it used to rain down rockets on Israel from Gaza, and Hamas later thanked Iran for providing the group with the rockets. Following the Hamas's delegation visit to Tehran, some Palestinian media outlets had reported that Saudi Arabia had called certain Hamas officials to voice its displeasure with the visit. So, here we go. We have Hamas and Iran joining forces. Both want to annihilate Israel. And we're allowing Iran to build a nuclear weapon. Now, Jesus talked about wars and rumors of wars in the last days. And uh, that's exactly where we're at right now. And you can just see it. World War III right on the horizon. In fact, the aforementioned Pope Francis says we're already in World War III. Now, speaking of Hamas, here's an article out of uh, Times of Israel today. Israeli aircraft strike Gaza targets after a rocket attack. So again, Hamas supposedly you know, wants peace. Palestinians want peace. But today, Hamas fired rockets at Israel again. Uh, no reports of injuries as planes bomb Hamas-controlled territory for the first time since the summer war. Um, it says Gaza residents reported low-flying Israeli aircraft over the uh, Palestinian enclave, with and multiple airstrikes. Unconfirmed reports indicated Israeli warships may also have shelled the Gaza Strip. Uh, the IDS spokesperson unit said in a statement that Israeli planes struck Hamas terror infrastructure site in southern Gaza in response to Friday's rocket attack, and that uh, a direct was confirmed. Um, it was the third time that Gaza terrorists have fired rockets at Israel since the conclusion of Operation Protective Edge, last summer's war between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Um, so... Again, Hamas fired first, but the world always condemns Israel for retaliating, trying to protect itself. Um, but that's, very, again, very, very interesting news story because wait till you hear the next news story. Again, there was the big war in Gaza in the, in the summer, and uh, Israel, the IDF, destroyed Hamas's terror tunnels that they used to try to smuggle terrorists up into Israel through these tunnels. And uh, they've been Hamas and Gaza. They've been complaining that the, it's been too slow in getting funds to them to rebuild Gaza after the damage of, that they uh, received in the in the battle during the summer. But guess what's happening to the funds that's been given to them? Here it is, all the Times of Israel day. Cement for rebuilding Gaza diverted to terror tunnels, and we want to make Israel give up their land and join. In a peace, uh, you know, in a peace agreement with these people who will never want peace, will never agree to live side by side in peace and harmony and peace and security, two states, two peoples, not going to happen. Even if Israel gives them most of their land, it's not going to bring peace. And here we go. They're using. They're already rebuilding their tunnels. They're using the money given to them to rebuild the city, 
and they're diverting it to rebuild the terror tunnels. Hamas bolstering its capabilities and coming up with new strategies in the wake of war. The Hamas terror group has been redoubling its efforts to restore the to restore the cross-border offensive tunnels that were destroyed by Israel during last summer's war. According to the reports, some of the cement and other materials being delivered to the coastal Palestinian territory was part of an international rebuilding effort and has been diverted to the tunnels. Hamas has realized that the tunnels which were used to stage attacks on Israeli military targets during the war provide it with a psychological edge over residents of Israeli border towns in the area. Wow. Uh, the Gaza group has also begun restocking its depleted rocket arsenal. Of course, they fired one today. Um, the Hebrew Media Report says some rockets were imported through smuggling tunnels from Egypt and others are manufactured in the Strip. Many of the smuggling tunnels, one of Hamas's main source of revenue, was still open for business despite massive efforts by Egypt to crack down on them. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. So, Hamas and other terror groups fired over 4,500 rockets and projectiles projectiles out of Israel and staged several deadly attacks against IDF soldiers through cross-border tunnels. 72 Israelis were killed throughout the operation this summer. And again, they're diverting funds, Hamas says, to rebuild the terror tunnels. But for some reason, we're going to uh, assume that they really do want peace, I guess. Um, Pope Francis will step in soon to save the day. Uh, let's do one more article on the roars and rumors of wars front. Obama warns North Korea over Sony attack. This is out of Yahoo News. We will respond, he says. Uh, U.S. President Barack Obama on Friday warned North Korea it would face retaliation for a crippling cyber attack on Sony, uh, on Sony uh, Pictures over an irre irreverent film comedy. Obama said the movie giant had made a mistake in, con in canceling the Christmas Day release of the interview. Um... Sony def defended its, situ its, its uh, decision to cancel it. Addressing reporters after the FBI was to blame Obama said Washington would never bow to some dictator. Uh, he bows to dictators there all the time. What's he talking about? Uh, we, will we will respond. We will respond proportionately and we'll respond in place, in a place and time and manner that we choose. I, mean, I am sympathetic, I am sympathetic to, to the concerns that they faced Having said all that, yes, I think they made a mistake. He's talking about Sony. We cannot have a society in which some dictator, some place, can start imposing censorship here in the United States. Really? Barack Hussein Obama, you're a dictator, and that's exactly what you're trying to do, and he's wanting to take more control of the Internet. But, uh, wow, okay. Um, wars and rumors of wars. But apparently we are going to retaliate. Um... Uh, It's again a pretty long article, but uh, I'll put this in the description box. Let me get into some scripture now that goes to all the new stories I talked about tonight. Guys, the final seven year period of time starts when the Antichrist comes on the scene and confirms a covenant with many that's going to guarantee the security of Israel, divide the land. Two-state solution, but it's called a covenant with many because it will no doubt involve an agreement with all the Muslim uh, countries, as well as probably the EU. And if the United States is still around, the United States. Uh, so let's look at uh, some scripture here. Daniel chapter eight, verses twenty-three to twenty-five. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. This he is the Antichrist. Let's look at uh, some more verses about the character of this guy. Dan Daniel 11, verses 36 through 39. 
And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers. If it's Pope Francis, and he's going to go completely against the Catholic Church, then he would not regard the god of his fathers, the previous fathers of the church nor the desire of women Pope Francis a celibate nor regard any God for he shall magnify himself above all but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces and the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things thus shall he do in the, do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and, and increase with glory and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And the uh, strange God is going to be this so-called God that everybody worships the same God, God. Not the God of the Bible, not the God that sent his son Jesus Christ to save humanity. In fact, again, Pope Francis has said it's dangerous to try to think that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. And to be happy, don't try to save others. Um, let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 9, 26 and 27. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Jesus Christ was crucified. That was the end of 69 weeks of a 70 week prophecy. The weeks are weeks of years, seven year period of time. But not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. The people of the prince to come shall destroy the city that was the Roman Empire. Titus and the Roman Empire destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in A.D. 70. The revived Roman Empire will reign in the last days. Headed up by the false prophet and the Antichrist. In verse 27, Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And uh, let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This will also reference the temple and the Antichrist. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. Starting at verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. The world will not endure sound doctrine. The falling away is definitely here. Uh, that's why we have people like Rick Warren promoting Chrislam. He's got a huge evangelical Protestant church, but he's promoting Chrislam in the one world religion. And almost now worshiping the Pope. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let's skip down. Verse uh, 6, and now you know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they have received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, and they should believe, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All the mockers, all the scoffers, all the people that will not wake up, who've heard the gospel, and if you live in America, you've probably heard the gospel repeatedly, and they keep ignoring it and mocking and scoffing their hearts have been hardened they're not going to be saved and even after the rapture of the church god is going to send a strong delusion and people will believe it and they will worship the beast let's close with revelation chapter 13 and i stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy 
And uh, you know, I read an article earlier today. Pope Francis continu continues to take the world by storm. That's what's going to happen with the beast as he rises. He's going to take the world by storm. He's going to come out of nowhere. And on the world scene, and the whole world's going to love him and follow him. Sounds familiar? We've seen it happen twice. Barack Obama and now Pope Francis. Verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and his great authority. Again, the dragon, Satan, is the one who gives the Antichrist his power and authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's the final three and a half year period of time of Daniel's 70th week. He's going to come on the scene and confirm the covenant with many, but Satan doesn't enter him, and, and he doesn't totally become the Antichrist. With the and, and, and the mark of the beast is not enforced until three and a half years, the final three and a half year period of time. Uh, which Jesus referred to as, he said, then there, then sh there shall be great tribulation after you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. This is Matthew twenty four fifteen. Jesus quoted the verse I read earlier, Daniel nine twenty seven, And here it's referred to again in uh, Revelation 13. And he opened his mouth to blasphemy against to blasphemy against in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle on them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war of the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And we already see people practically worshiping Pope Francis, even non Catholics. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, verse 11, Revelation 13 and 11, is the false prophet. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. There will be beheadings for anybody that receives, that, excuse me, that does not receive the mark of the beast. The people who do receive the mark of the beast will be eternally damned. Uh, verse 16, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for as the number of a man and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Revelation 13 talks about the rise of the Antichrist and the false prophet, the one world religion and the one world government. And the news stories every single day that we're seeing tell you that we are absolutely coming down to that point in time. If you believe what I believe, and I believe clearly this is what the, the Bible teaches. The church will not be here during that time period. But that time period does not start until the covenant with many is confirmed. And who knows how much delay there could be in that. And we don't know how bad it's going to get to now and then. So we need to be prepared for anything and everything we may face, including death. But at some point, that trumpet is going to sound and the church is going to go home but between now and then, look out. I'm telling you, it can get really, really bad. And there, like I said, there could be bloodshed. There could be war between the true Christians and, and, the, and the Laodicean church, the lukewarmers, and, and the people buying into the Pope Francis movement or the One World Ecumenical Movement. And we could be thrown in prison or whatever for saying Jesus is the only way soon. 
But that's actually good news. If you know Jesus as your Savior, and you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have been saved, that you have been born again, bought with the blood of the Lamb, then nothing that happens to you in this world really can can hurt you. Jesus said, do not fear man who can kill your body, but not your soul, but fear God who can kill both body and soul in hell. What, we can, if, if somebody beheads us or whatever, so be it. We are immediately to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, and we will be in heaven for eternity with God. We need to pray for strength, wisdom, discernment. And we need to stay faithful to our King. He's coming soon. All of the signs He gave us are here. He told us to look for them, and they're here. Make sure you're ready. If not, today is a day of salvation. You're running out of time. These news stories, I, it's amazing how fast these things are moving now. So keep looking up. All the signs are here. God bless everyone.